that's Nuno Weins here. Woo! Okay, yeah, great, thanks. So um, I brought us something, it's a bin, and um, we'll come back to it later. But um, first of all, I hope this is my presentation, is it? Great, so um, yeah, nice to meet you all. Maybe you can work on it, because it um, doesn't matter, I do have some questions for you. So, um, it's not an energizer, don't worry, but at least you will have to raise your hands. So, I'm asking you, is there like one product or service that you guys have been working on in the past that failed after being launched? If there was one product or service, please raise your hand. People laughing? Okay. Okay, yeah, just, just keep your hands up. I'm also guilty, sorry for that. Um, so, is there at least one product or service that didn't perform up to the expectations? Raise your hand too. Okay, more hands, more hands. Great, okay. Um, keep your hands up still. And last question, is there maybe one concept that you guys were working on that never made it to launch day? Okay, more hands. Well, um, you get the idea. I will be talking today about ideas, startup product and service ideas. And to be a bit more specific, I will be talking about killing ideas. So I want us all today to really appreciate the fact that we have to kill more ideas, to omit ideas, to really get rid of them. Because, as you will see, it's really important to falsify ideas. And then I will also be talking about um, how do we explain to like stakeholders and clients how like falsification, like how to accept them, right? So those are my talking points, and let's dive into it. Well, maybe first of all, um, that's me over there. I'm Nono, I'm team lead UX and service design at Orbit Ventures. Um, Orbit Ventures is a venture building firm based here in Hamburg, and we um, join forces with corporates, especially German corporates, to build new startups, new ventures, and um, yeah, it's always very exciting, and we are really like in different um, industries, so it's really always a very changing environment. And to go back to one of our talks earlier, we are always navigating like those uncertain Christopher Columbus waters. And um, that's actually the most official picture you will hopefully get from me. Normally my work life looks more like that, um, building crazy service prototypes and trying to deliver things around town. So that was like a prototype we did um, during, I think it was like for one week, and we were really like I was delivering stuff to people around town to see how they perceive this new service concept. Um, so let's dive into this whole idea of failure, right? I think most of you will know this number. I checked it. It's really true. Um, like new research, show, research shows, nine of ten startups fails. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot of number. Just imagine, like all those red bubbles. Those are businesses, people working their ass off to just get those businesses online, and then they fucking fail, right? That's something that's really bad. I don't want that. Then we do have products. Products, four of 10 products fail. That's also still a lot. Imagine 40% of all products, like visual, um, not visual, like tangible products um, that are launched fail um, after, they, after their market launch. And then service is a bit better, but still three of 10. So that amounts to a lot of uncertainty. And when, when we launch products, we can't be too sure that our products, our services, that they will succeed in the market. We have to really tackle that uncertainty. And that's something that I really like you guys to take with today, and I will explain how to tackle this uncertainty. And ha let's have a closer look at startups. So the second most important need, um, reason why startups fail is that there is no market need. And that's something different than a user need, as I will show to you. And today, let's maybe split that a bit down to um, no market need means the offering was not desirable to the targeted audience. And there are like a lot of examples, maybe you already have some in mind. A really, import, a really prominent is Google Glass. They invested millions, I guess, and the product actually really failed. Big, also a funny example, a bit more recent one, Juiceru. It's actually like a homemade device, a home, home appliance, I think, for around 600 euros or so, that helps you to do something that you can do with your hands. So um, the, there was like a lot of investment, a lot of like VC capital, and um, the, pro the product failed. And an even more recent one, which is a really shameful story, yeah, thanks for that, um, to um, white guys um, trying to invent a product for women's health, which actually meant the whole process more shameful than it is. It's just a normal thing. And um, luckily, they failed quite big. And 
I think the point I want to make is we can't be so sure that our ideas, our concepts are really desirable to people. So what is desirability? Maybe some of you will already know it. So desirability is a really important part of every product or service. You really need, take, need to take care of it. And it normally answers the question, do people want it? It's not a question, does it fit any actual user need or user pain? It's more, do they really want it and will they buy it? So it's um, also the question, are they willing to pay for it? That's quite important to keep in mind, right? And um, if you want to build a good product or service, you also need to consider feasibility and viability, maybe a few other things too. Um, I won't be talking about feasibility and viability, but in short, feasibility is, um, is something technically possible, is it legally possible, and um, viability is more like the business side of things, can we make money with it? And a good product or service is like in a sweet spot. And today, I will just have a look at desirability, all those other things you have to test them to before you launch a product or service. So desirability, what is it actually? Well, there are different stages to desirability. First of all, people need to be aware that your product or service is, is out there. Then um, people normally inform themselves about it. They get like interested in it. And then hopefully a certain desire, a desire to buy that product or service develops. And then after that, after the desire, the action takes place and people actually yeah, get involved with it. And I would like to argue and to remind us all, we have to test desirability, interest, and maybe awareness, maybe something that you can't really um, test, but something that you have to create. And action is something that happens when you launch your MVP, right? That's when people really can interact with it. But before you do that, you have to test desirability. And well, um, some of you will maybe say, well, I do user research. Great, we all need to do user research. That is a part of that, but it's not the sole answer to it. Because user research just means you research paints, all those red rectangles, and then you do some kind of ideation and you match ideas to all those paints. Maybe there's one idea that serves different paints, maybe one paint you can't really solve. So you have this kind of match, and that is something that we call a problem solution fit. So your solution does fit a problem, but it, that's more theoretical, right? Because you haven't really tested that. And it's a really, I think, especially like we are building startups, so we can't really on just like, I don't know, a couple interviews, a couple of quantitative testing, we can't go to an investor and say, okay, let's give us 10 millions and then let's do it. Because as I showed you before, it's really likely that our service and product will fail. So we really need to test this kind of desirability. And to have a closer look at it, there's not only one solution out there, and it's normally not our solution. There are different other solutions too. For instance, one solution is maybe cheaper than our solution. Another solution is maybe more shiny, more appealing to users. Another solution maybe has a better product a product, a problem solution fit. And as you see, our market share is getting smaller and smaller. And since we are the newest player around, um, most likely people don't like us too much, right? So it takes a lot of investment and we need to keep that in mind. So how do we test this? Well, we do what we call desirability testing. And during desirability testing, we do test ideas. So desirability testing, do not confuse it with usability testing. That's something different, as I will show you. Here, during desirability testing, we ask us which idea shall we actually later realize. And doing usability testing, we already decided on an idea, and then we ask us, okay, is it maybe a different color, maybe a different form, maybe what is the content of it, what is like the process, how do people interact with it? But you can't just jump right to that stage. You need to make sure what kind of product or service you want to build before. So how, why do we do this? Well, I think you already got the point. All of you had, almost everybody had his hand raised before. And um, there's a lot of a big chance for falsification during this process, and we need to do that as early as possible before we waste a lot of resources on it. So I guess most of you will know this really nice claim fell early. Everybody writes it, everybody shouts it. I would argue, especially in Germany, it's not that common. So I would argue that's more the reality. People or products or services fail quite late. So you invest a huge box of costs and time and effort 
but you get actually the same result as if you would do it quite faster, quite cheaper. And that is what we call desirability testing and like the main reason why we do it and why we get to, um, why, why we are quite, a, quite um, successful in sell, selling it to our partners and clients. So let's have a closer look. So this whole phase, we split it up normally in four sprints. We call them idea sprints or desirability sprints. And during each sprint, as you can see, the whole investment of time and effort is rising, of course, because you take longer, you maybe increase the complexity of each test method. And then, on the other hand, we start with different, uh, many ideas, and then we uh, follow, a, uh, follow an exclusion process and we kind of narrow down the ideas that we have. So it's like a bit like Germany's Next Top Model, right? So in the end, just one idea is left, maybe sometimes no idea is left. And um, the great thing about that process is that we get rising confidence throughout the whole process, because the final idea, the one sole idea that is left, or maybe sometimes it's no idea, we tested this idea in different iterations. So we tested it with different methods, different peoples on different levels, and tested different aspects of it, so we can be quite sure that this idea is something worth to pursue, and we can pitch it to some capital or corporate um, innovation hubs, and then we go out and fund it, uh, and, and uh, build an MVP, sorry. So um, I do have some examples, or one example, actually. And first of all, I would like to ask you guys, what is this? What could this be? A Nussknacker, OK. Somebody else? OK, something for plants. OK, we'll see. Any other ideas? Maybe something to cook, OK? Almost. Maybe one more. A lamp. Uh, sorry? A lamp. A lamp. Right, cool. Yeah. Lamp. Yeah, it looks really like a lamp, right? OK, um, bear with me. So um, it's not something to cook with. It's not like an electronic fork or something. Um, it's also not a COVID-19 reusable um, test. Sorry for that. It's also not a, a certain bedroom device. <laughs> Um, that you could use. It's something very different. Actually, um, one person during our testing thought that this was actually like a sex toy. Um, it is not. So, um, however, you were right. It is actually a plant sensor. So you put this thing into your plant pot, and then you can measure the light intensity, the soil nutrition, the air temperature, and the humidity of your plant. And the data is then transmitted to an app, and you can get actual care instructions. So um, here it's like a German screen, sorry for that, but it says, well, I'm thirsty, give me 100 milliliters of water. So um, when I first thought, I heard that, I was like, oh, wow, that's quite cool. I want to have that. So, and when we bought some of our competitor products to test them, I was really happy with it. But bear with me, the story is going to change, right? Um, so we did that together with um, Ubi. Ubi is um, the largest hardware store here, a hardware retailer in Germany. And they also do have plants in their portfolio. And they do have a really um, great um, innovation factory uh, called Squared. And we work with them together for, I think, one and a half years now. So they are our client, but we have a really great partnership. So we work really on eye level. And so everything that I pre present, we did together with them. Um, so, why was this plant sensor interesting for Ubi? Well, they saw that there is an indoor plant trend. A lot of people, especially um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, were buying plants for their houses. And then we also saw that there are new players on the market. There was also some investment, not too big, but at least it was kind of developing. And um, also, um, we were anticipating some user pains around plants. If you have plants at home, I guess you already noticed it's sometimes a bit difficult. Yeah, a lot of people nod. Um, so the whole question was, do those things add up to this plant sensor? And would this maybe be a standalone business model? Would this maybe be something which um, Obi could distribute to maybe younger um, um, target groups and would maybe help Obi to interact more often? Because, of course, you would use this app to check out the plant and would be more in, in um, contact with your, client, with your target group. So with that question in mind, we started. We did some user research. We found out um, a lot of pain points actually around plants. It's really great and really interesting. 
um, I think 75% um, of all people that we ask had um, p uh, plants dying in their, in their rooms. 96% of them really tried to um, save those plants, but I don't know the number anymore, but I think it was around 60% really failed to save their plants. So actually, we thought, well, that sounds like a pretty good problem solution fit, right? Um, then, as I showed you before, we have this exclusion process. So we didn't want to just bet everything or put all our money just on one idea. So we also developed more ideas. So we had five ideas later on. And then we started with um, this uh, idea testing, and we did this. And the first iteration, we did qualitative value proposition testing. That's pretty straightforward, actually. You have just, like, over here, 10 um, testees, and we show them really easy, really um, unbeautiful, on purpose designed um, value proposition flyers. So there's a short description of the idea, and then there's also like a black and white drawing. So because we don't want to bias people just because of them in, in terms of design and everything. And then we um, gather a qualitative feedback, and then we ask them how to rank those ideas. And um, the ranking actually was like this. The plant sensor really was up in, in this iteration and this kind of Q&A community around plants and, and insurance. There's really a plant insurance on the market. We tried this too. Um, they uh, were really not appealing to people. So we already discarded those ideas. So five, two, three. And then we did almost the same um, with uh, 1,000 testes. Um, we did quantitative testing and asked more or less the same questions, a bit different, of course, because it's a different kind of method. And again, um, the plant sensor was perceived quite well in comparison to the other ideas, but still not really good, right? So we were left with one idea, and then we did something that we call live prototype testing. Um, I really love those tests, so that's something like you saw before me on the bike, that's also a live prototype or a service prototype. And we did that here too um, with 15 people, and we gave them this product, which is not ours, it's a competitor product and they used this product for six weeks, and we did some kind of diary study and um, tracked all the data that they were producing to see how long would they actually interact. Because one of the main goals or ideas about this product was, is it possible to um, make people interact more with our brand? And, um, well, um, that's how it actually looks. Those are p pictures from people using them. Actually, and that's interesting, the product really is in a way feasible. Um, or like producing a like good results as you can see over here. That's before, <laughs> that's after. So um, pretty great, but to be honest, it's uh, still bezel. So this costs maybe one one euro fifty or so, and you could just buy a new bezel plant. So as I do, like every week, kind of. Um, so anyhow, um, it was kind of working for those people. There were also some people were happy with it. But in the end, we really noticed during the data and also with their feedback that they thought it's more like a gimmick, like a gadget, not really producing long value. And especially because when you use this product like for two weeks, you kind of get the hang of it. Uh, you kind of understand your plans, and then the, the value of the product is really diminishing. So yeah, live prototype testing, again, another X. So the plant sensor was also not the thing. However, this is just like a really small sample. So we did something that we call, or which is called fake door testing. And that is now like, I really tried to, to um, put like 4.2 million dots here, but then like my, my keynote presentation just really was not working up. So um, a lot of people saw ads that we actually produced for this product. And we were actually tracking um, uh, conversion rates and click rates to see would people actually buy it. And fake door testing, as the name actually a bit suggests, is um, a test method where you suggest to users that the pro a product is already there. So to people, it seems like they could already buy that product. However, the product is not really there. So there is no real value creation. So yeah, maybe it's a bit deceiving. Uh, ask about it later. Um, however, it's really helpful because it gives us really good insights about the whole um, thing that we were testing. How does this normally work? So we do produce display ads, pretty, pretty standard. We um, distribute them around um, different media um, channels. Then people who click 
on this ad are actually referred to our websites. Um, we built this just, I don't know, in two days or so with some website builders, really to keep it fast. And um, we only have time for around two weeks for this whole test iteration. And then um, the interesting thing, fact here was um, we always measure a click rate and then compare it to a benchmark, so something that you could expect for this kind of channel and this kind of um, ad that you were pushing. And we saw that um, the ads were performing really well. So people were interested. So, and actually 17% above um, benchmark, so that's actually a good, inter a good thing, right? Then um, on the website, people could inform themselves, and then they could go here on this button and um, could um, actually leave their email address. Because we told them here, oh, sorry, the product is right now not available. Leave your email, and we'll um, remind, um, notify you when the product is available again. And um, so that did not happen very often. And I did like factor tests where we had like conversion rates of 25% or so. And um, here we did have a conversion rate, um, I think, of way less than 1%. And this was really way above average. Um, so 82% um, below the benchmark. So people did not really leave their email addresses. They were not really interested. Like we can, could also back up from other like the other iterations we did. And that's actually how it looks. So you could enter your email here. And um, so we actually learned um, there is maybe an interest for the product, but there is no real desire to buy it. And we also learned from the other tests, especially this um, diary study, that people don't really use it for a long time. So there was no real value. And in the end, we learned the desirability of this product is low. And we did, of course, also feasibility and viability testing, business case calculations, everything. And uh, the plant sensor is actually, it's dead. So thanks for that. Um, so yeah, it's sometimes hard to accept that, especially this um, sensor was also like a darling of uh, one of our client-sided stakeholders, or not only one, several stakeholders. And um, sometimes it's hard really to accept that fact, right? Um, I still have some colleague um, from, from Squared who still says to me, I still believe it's work. It will work. It will work. And I'm, no, sorry, I have the data. It won't work. So um, how do we deal with a product or services failure? Well, at Orbit, um, we have contracts that are really open, and the scope is open. Um, if you're familiar with Agile and everything, you know what I mean. But we really try to incorporate that in our whole work environment. So, our budget is fixed, our time is fixed, our team is fixed. That is something that we promise our clients. So you have those people working for eight months for that amount of money. In the end, we will promise you that you will have some kind of result, but we can't tell you if, it's, if you falsify, validate, verify, whatever, um, your product or service. Then another thing is, um, yeah, that's quite obvious maybe, but we really try to lift that very strongly. Um, we integrate and co-create. So we don't have this chit-chat between client and service provider and this, uh, I don't know, two-week turners where you just uh, talk to each other. We really incorporate them into our teams. So we um, have really those um, yeah, collaborative co-creation teams. So um, we really ask them to invest maybe 25% or 50% of their work time to work together with us. And that's really great because that builds trust that builds understanding, and in the long run, they really learn something from us, and we learn something from them, because we work with a lot of different industries, and maybe I'm definitely no finance expert, I'm also not a logistics expert, I'm also not like a plant expert, but involving those people into your process helps us to understand something, helps them to understand something, and in the end, um, we just really all accept the outcome of our projects. Then we do expectation management, and that's, especially for me, I'm also a project lead on those projects, really, really important. Um, of course, we do not promise things that we can't hold. We also clearly communicate right from the start that there is a really high possibility that products or services or ideas in general that we look at will fail. So we show them the data I just showed you and really try to make them really understand what could happen, right? And then, for us, of course, it's really important, as a service provider, that a failing product is not mistaken with a failing project. That's something totally different. So we do have separate KPIs. So for instance, if um, a solution can fail, 
but a project can be successful. And that's something that we, during our kickoffs, really um, take time and take um, really effort to make clear what does the project has to deliver. For instance, that could be like, uh, we will do 10 interviews or interviews in general. We will build a prototype. We will test this prototype in a real world environment. We will speak to um, employees in the market and everything. And um, on the other side, it could be, okay, the, I don't know, net promoter score of the prototype should be that, or that amount of money uh, should be earned with the MVP and whatsoever. And then, obviously, something else, um, database argumentation. I think everybody of us is doing it here, but especially when you talk with other tribes, and um, I think my, sometimes that is missing, at least in my perspective. So data eats gut feeling for breakfast, um, I really love that, and at Orbit we really say that every argument that we make has to be supported by data. Keep in mind, our stakeholders are not really deciding about, okay, should this button be red or blue? Our stakeholders are deciding, should we invest 10 million in this startup, or should we invest nothing in that startup? And I can't tell them, well, yeah, I, I spoke with three people, I think they would like it, that's not significant, that is not right. And that's some why we do all this more or less difficult process. And we also test for statistical significance when we do quantitative testing. And we also do use um, different data sources, different data points, different methods, which is called triangulation, to really understand um, or, or to really have a strong foundation for our cases. Then lastly, that's something that took a while to learn. And especially this uh, plant sensor project is a good example. Because in the end, um, everybody was happy, but we did not have any alternative, right? We had five ideas, and we learned that no of idea, none of those ideas is really worth to pursue. That was fine, but um, sometimes it's better to have at least one alternative in the end. So nowadays, we do not start with just one idea, because as I told you, the chance is quite high that it will be falsified. And nowadays, we start with um, opportunity profiles. So this could be, for instance, electromobility, and within this opportunity profile, there are like uh, opportunity field are different profiles. So I don't know, EV charging solutions, um, e-scooters, and I don't know, e um, an infrastructure a business model. And by that, we have a greater chance of finding at least one solution that will not fail. And that's what we try nowadays to start with with our clients. Normally, of course, clients come to us and say, oh, I thought our competitor is doing this and that. I want to do that too. And uh, we said, OK, nice, let's move out. Let's, let's zoom out and do understand like, the whole field, and let's see if that's really one idea that we should pursue. Yeah, those are, like, I think, the main points, at least in our experience, that are helpful in falsifying ideas. And um, now the whole question is, what could be the outcome? At least and in the end, we are a service provider. We earn money by people working together with us. And in the end, we build startups together. And well, the outcome here was um, we asked our clients to give qualitative and quantitative feedback, and they were really happy with the project. So that was really interesting, even up to the CEO and upper management. They all thought, wow, that's great. So finally, somebody tells me not to invest money. And so they really liked it. And um, then it helped us on another level to really build a foundation of trust um, for future projects and that we could build on, 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 on that. And I do have a really nice quote from Kai. He is venture building lead at Squared. We work very closely together. And he actually said after this project, he now sees that he can trust us because he knows that we won't suggest anything to them that is not really worth um, a try and not really successful for them. So of course, maybe on a co short run, it would be more interesting for us to say, oh, yeah, maybe it's not the best product. But hey, let's do it. Let's sell another tech team, which will develop it for one year. In the end, we would fail. And since we are really keen on delivering impact together, that's our slogan, um, that is not like something that we are really interested in. We are not a consultancy like building slide decks, sending them over, and goodbye. We really want to go into those ventures together. So that's not something that we do. And actually, our pro, um, I have proof for that that it works. Um, now we have two teams working on that client, which is like um, really interesting for us because it's like an increase in revenue, right? So. Um, keep that in mind, be strong, be bold, and go out there in the end. It can help you. You have to be brave enough. And the good thing is now um, there's not like one team of our side or one team of our client working on this failed product. 
now we are working on really interesting, um, really, really promising things right now. And would we have done like um, this um, plant sensor, we would have lost a lot of time and res wasted a lot of resources. Yeah, that's from my side. Um, please take away your um, solution will most likely fail all of our solutions and that therefore test its desirability before building an MVP, before. And thanks for your attention. And maybe you want to give feedback and maybe connect. And I do also have like, I'm a researcher, so I do have another question in this short type form because I really would like to know if you test desirability. So just if you feel, if you want to, um, just check it up. And down here, most of you won't see it. This is the team, it's not my effort. Uh, many people are working on it. Thanks.